My interview with Norm Davis, editorial director of WJXT in the 50s and 60s. Norm, take us back to the days when Channel 4 got involved with investigative reporting and paved the way to some extent for consolidation. Sure. I think the place to begin is to talk about the, the uh, development of the station's first uh, news department because until 1960 it had none. Uh, Bill Grove was, uh, had been with the station for quite a few years at that point, that point being 1960, but uh, there had been no news department with adequate resources and, and the planning and development agendas and things like that. But in 1960, that came to pass. And at that point in time, I had been doing general purpose uh, activities for the station, and I moved into that news department with Bill and a number of other people. And what we did was, at that time, commit to, uh, particularly in, in, the, uh, in the areas where I would be active, to doing editorials with some regularity, meaning two or three times a week, doing uh, documentaries, half-hour programs, and occasionally a one-hour program on various topics and issues. And the third uh, dimension had to do with investigative news reports. These would be uh, four or five minute, sometimes six minute reports that uh, were the result of some very serious and professional digging and investigation into problems in the community. So we committed at the outset to doing those things. And it, it needs to be said that at that time none of us had had any experience in working for a television news organization. So. I had a journalism degree, but I had not had any serious opportunity to apply it. And there weren't many role models elsewhere no. in television. No, there really were not, particularly not on a local level. And I'm not sure at that point in time how many uh, local stations in America actually had active and, and, and uh, developed news uh, organizations. But we, uh, Bill Grove and I, committed at that time to do these things aggressively and professionally and carefully and seriously. Now those are the words that I, I think fit and that's what we did. So we, in learning how to do those things, we took those, those, those criteria into the, into the job. So starting in 1960, we began to do uh, those three things. We began to do editorials and and documentaries, and the investigative reports came along a little bit later because it took time to get talent on board, uh, people who had the ability to get out and, and do serious digging and inquiry, and then assemble what could be said to be an investigative report. Now, once we had created that, uh, that set of instruments, we began to look around in the community to see what it is we should cover. And oh my, did we find a vast array of problems and issues. And let me just touch on a few of those, because at that point in time, the political community in, in Jacksonville and in Duval County uh, was, was not active at all. And the problems I'm going to start mentioning now were in many ways ignored, not only by the political uh, structure in, in the community, but by the business community. And it was just a, a passive, uh, benign environment. But that environment contained a lot of extremely serious problems. Uh, perhaps the most prominent problem at that time was the, the school system, which uh, had been uh, poorly financed over a generation and was in terrible, terrible shape. And as early as 1959, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools warned the Duval County, which operated this, the, the, had the school district, that disaccreditation could be on the horizon and losing accreditation from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools uh, could be a, a, a cataclysm because the Southern Association had never done that in its history, had never stripped a county a school system of, of that kind of, of, uh, 
of labeling. And that did happen. That did happen. That's accreditation. That did happen. It happened, as I remember, about 1961 or possibly 1962. The other thing that went in tandem with that school problem was the tax base issue in the community. There had not been a reassessment of property values in more than 20 years, none at all, which means that the tax base kept getting narrower and narrower. And whereas the base should have been, and I don't have numbers at hand, should have been much, much broader given the realities of the time, the tax base was very narrow. And the millage rates, I mean, in order to extract revenues out of a tax base that narrow, the, the millage rates were very, very high. So the people on the tax rolls who were paying uh, uh, meaningful taxes were paying indeed. They were, they were supporting the rest of, of the community, and, and that did not work. And the, the, the shortage of revenues affected a lot of different aspects of public life in the community, but primarily the school system. And so when disaccreditation did take place, uh, it amounted to what I consider to be a major shock to the people who lived here, and rightly so. They began suddenly to fear that the colleges and universities would not accept applicants graduating from high schools that had no accreditation by anybody, because accreditation was a national process and had been in, in history for, I don't know, half a century or, or longer. So there was that huge problem, and we began to deal with that uh, in very direct and tangible ways, because uh, it was right there on our, on our doorstep. There were other problems as well, and we began to find, uh, I'm going to use the word corruption, because it was there, and it was there in abundance. As we began our inquiries, uh, we found uh, the corruption to be pri predominantly in the city of Jacksonville to a lesser degree, but still there in the county. And as we began over a period of two, three, four years to dig into aspects of the way the city was operating, we turned over all kinds of stones and all kinds of things began to crawl out. So the, the corruption uh, applied to local government, but it wasn't corruption so much in the school system, it was just inadequate funding. And That's correct. Now, there, uh, to touch on a point you raised, there, was, there were some leadership issues in the school system. The, at that time, the school superintendent was elected. And the school superintendent, who had been in office for a long, long time, his name was Ish Grant, had to look over his shoulder because he had to come up for re-election periodically. And there wasn't adequate leadership at the top of the system. In the course of events, uh, particularly after the disaccreditation, the system was changed and the superintendency became an appointive position. Uh, we editorially strongly supported that. Well, let, let's get back to the corruption, okay. which I don't think is uh, an inappropriate term of what was going on based on what I've learned subsequently. Right. Well, we began to find uh, a whole host of sort of fundamental problems. Purchasing, for example. Uh, the city in buying insurance, in buying motor vehicles, in, in purchasing other types of things that you need to operate a city, began to favor certain local businesses and would make purchases at, with very high awards without competitive bidding. And while the, the total dollar amounts that were being wasted at that time, as you look back on them years later, they don't seem to be very large. In that time, and in the context of that economy, those were big numbers. And we began to find over and over and over again that the purchasing uh, practices in the city were just horrible. And as we did these things, as we began to reveal these things and put these things on the air, the city officials didn't care. They weren't impressed at all with what we were doing. And, and I, I want to go ahead and say quickly that no other news organizations in the community were doing that. Uh, I think that was uh, very sad. But the, the, uh, the newspapers at that time were benign. 
they would uh, touch this or that, but they weren't digging as we were. And the other major television station in town, Channel 12, was not doing it either. So we were alone, <laughs> and it was a little bit a little bit testy to have nobody out there backing you up. And the corruption, uh, public officials were abusing the public trust. Absolutely. And, and of course, uh, you'll get to this, but some of them went to prison. Yeah, that, that comes a little bit later, but yes, they did. But the, the, the primary uh, point I would make at, at this place in the, in the history in, in the 1960s was that the, the, the public officials didn't care. They were annoyed greatly by what we were doing. Uh, I, I've mentioned purchasing practices. There were many other types of practices, particularly within the city, to a certain extent within the county government as well. In the misuse of public employees, they used to use, the city used to use a lot of uh, public employees to go out and work actively in political campaigns. Uh, but the, the misuse of money and the misuse of authority was rampant. And I'm, I'm not sure Florida had ever seen anything like that. And as we began to expose all of that, again, the city officials were just angry because we were doing it. And they weren't taking any steps whatsoever to respond to it, to us, or to deal with it and acknowledge, yep, there's a problem there. We need to change the, the, the system that we've been using.